Welcome everyone to the Treatment Room Secrets podcast. I am here with Steph. Steph, help me pronounce your last name. I've asked you several times already, but I'm struggling. It's Stephanie Natchak. Stephanie Natchak, um, who is here in North Carolina with me. I'm back here in North Carolina with Joe. And um, you're here all the way from Winnipeg. I am Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. So Winnipeg, we were talking yesterday about how winter times we get to minus 40 Celsius, which is equal to minus 40 Fahrenheit as well. Um, so how is it as a running coach, also dietitian, we'll get into that, but as a running coach and as a runner yourself, how do you run in those um, in, in, in that weather? How do you deal with it as a runner? Yeah, I think that if there's one thing that that Canadians in particular, us in what we call Winterpeg, Manitoba, Winter is Peg. known for, it Noted. is our very, very uh, cold and sometimes very long winters. There's a huge running community here that, you know, doesn't matter the weather, you're getting outside. Thing is, your goals sometimes will change a little bit between winter running versus summer running. Of course, one of the most important things for running in the winter is making the investment in high quality gear that's going to keep you comfortable, warm and safe. Because once we start getting into those extremely cold temperatures, there is a safety risk that we just don't see in warmer weather. Hypothermia, frostbite, you know, all these kinds of things that, that can be really dangerous. So we need to take that into consideration. With When it comes to coaching, though, and, and kind of working with clients, you know, we have lots of options at our disposal. And the beautiful thing about today's technology and, and options is that we don't have to run outside if we don't want to. So if someone's running, no matter where in their world they happen to live, we've got things like treadmills. We've got things like indoor tracks. There are lots of options to still help us keep fit. Are, without, there, are there more, sorry, are there more indoor tracks like in Winnipeg, Manitoba for that reason? I mean, compared to like other cities, other places, I don't know, but there are a number of um, gyms and of course like schools and in our universities that do have indoor track facilities, probably significantly more than you might find someplace like Florida or California. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Um, but what, how do you prepare for running outside and do, do a lot of people still run outside? Do you run outside when it gets into those extreme weathers? Yeah. So there are a ton of people who still love running outdoors, no matter the season. I mean, maybe love is a strong word, but they really hate indoor running, don't yeah. want to run on a treadmill. And so, um, you know, gearing up, layering up and getting out there is really still the best option. But there are a lot of people who truly enjoy it and, and they like getting out there in the snow and in the elements and, and just enjoying themselves. We have to be looking out for slowing down, taking our time, especially when there's ice and snow is kind of part of the equation if we're looking at footwear. Really the key is layering up. So having high quality gear that we're wearing from a base layer to a mid layer and then our top kind of thicker, warmer windbreaker layer, you can stay surprisingly comfortable to some pretty extremely cold temperatures. I immediately think about my fingers um, and my toes more about the toes now that I'm thinking about it because there's a limit to how much you can layer up on your feet, no? Yeah, and you know, if you've got a good pair of wool socks, um, winter running shoes. So there's some differences between like the typical running shoes that you would wear in the summer that have lots of kind of openings and, and ventilation or very lightweight. Winter running shoes are a little bit more closed in or some people will even put something like duct tape over the vents and, and kind of those spots in their shoes just to trap mm. a little bit more heat in. What I would say, you know, fingers definitely is one thing. People will wear kind of double layered gloves. Once you start moving, once you start running, getting your blood pumping, uh, it's surprising how warm your feet actually get and how comfortable your feet can be. Most people, it's not their feet that are necessarily an issue. It's more of a problem of sometimes even over bundling, being so worried about getting cold that we overdress. But then we get really sweaty and when that sweat starts to dry is when we get chilled. So we want to really balance our need to stay warm and out of the elements with also wanting to make sure that we have fabrics that are going to wick sweat away from our bodies so that then we're not getting that chill if we're out there for too long. Yeah, cool. Uh, here it's 90 degrees and you said you went on a run this morning. Sure right? did. So In what is it? shorts and a tank top. How beautiful. So... <laughs> Is there advantages, though, to running when it's really cold out or is it a disadvantage? Personally, I 
love when it's winter, although my winters never get to as extreme as yours. I love when it's winter because I'm a sweater. Um, and in the summers, it's just, you know, after a few minutes of running, I'm already drenched and I just feel that my energy is really just evaporating, lit- quite literally, um, with every stride that I take. So when winter comes along, I just sweat way less and I feel like my runs as a result are a bit easier. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in these cooler temperatures and of course in drier temperatures, which what we tend to see in the winter time, we're not sweating as much. So we're not becoming dehydrated as quickly. Now, the thing is, in warmer weather, we can train our bodies to adapt to running in the heat and we actually will sweat more, but the composition of our sweat changes. So we conserve more sodium. We're still losing the same amount of water, but we're keeping in those electrolytes. So there's a little bit of a tricky balance with running in the heat versus running in the cold that it can be more challenging to do things like maintain hydration. In the cold, though, what I find is that the long-term training advantage that runners can see is that when you're kind of um, weighed down under these layers of gear, you're doing all this training in the winter. Once you get into spring and summer, where now you're out there running in, you know, a few pounds less of weight on you, even the most lightweight running gear, if we're starting to layer up with pants and sweaters and and jackets and all of that, it does have a little bit of weight to it. Once you take those off, it, it feels as though you have much more pep in your step, much more spring. Refreshed. Compared to kind of slogging through snowdrifts in the winter time. Yeah. From a training perspective, in the winter, you also really have to be thinking about your mechanics and really focus on slowing down. Because if you don't, you're at a much higher likelihood of slipping, tripping, falling. So you just need to be more careful and cautious with your footing, which ultimately lends itself to spending more time in your easy training zone. So the advantage isn't necessarily intentional, but it can lead to better performance once we start getting into more of of the spring and even summer races. Do you compete in races at all? I do. My favorite distance is half marathon. When did you uh, when did you start running in general, even before half marathons? Yeah. So well. <laughs> My first introduction to running was when I signed up for my first Ah, half marathon. (laughs) Okay. Hindsight, that maybe wasn't the best option, but I I never previously would have considered myself a runner. I would have been the person who thought distance running was boring and I didn't enjoy it and I wasn't good at it. Which you hear a lot. All the time. Right. All the time. And how old were you? Um, I would have been, this would have been in about 2013, so about 10 years ago. I would have been in my early 20s at the time. But some friends and I were planning on doing one of those big obstacle course races. So this was right when the Tough Mudders and the Spartan races and stuff like that were starting to pop up everywhere. They were getting really, really popular. So a group of friends and I all decided we wanted to do one of these events. We had our sights set on a Tough Mudder. Disclaimer, we never ended up actually making it to the Tough Mudder. We did some other shorter ones in the meantime, but I realized that this race, this obstacle course, they were on average about 12 to 14 miles long. And so I realized, well, if I'm going to do something like this obstacle course race, that's 12 to 14 mile distance, I need to be able to run a half marathon. And so what I did, this is about six months before for the race, I signed up for this half marathon and decided that I better train to be able to run a half marathon. And so that was really my introduction into running. And that's kind of when the spark for running came through for me because I realized that, you know, just by doing it consistently and sticking with it, I actually could start to maybe enjoy this a little bit and, and kind of seeing it through getting my medal at the end of that event. Um, you know, I've, I've been entering at least one or two races a year ever since. What do you think it is about running? Because there is something a bit, you know, you know, if you, if we, if we detach ourselves for a second and look at the actual act of running, you know, you leave like this morning, you leave your hotel room, you literally just go for a run and you return and you start your day and yes you feel good you're proud of you're you're proud of yourself you feel great and you're ready to attack the day there's all those little benefits to it Uh, but it is kind of a weird thing that we pursue and as you also spoke about it today like it's so popular like it's hard to really fathom how popular running is around the world what do you think it is about running yeah and and i think there's there's two things here there's the naturalness 
of it, right? The, the fact that most people can run. Not everyone can run a lot right away or easily. And, and of course, you know, we have to look at all different abilities there. But for most able-bodied individuals, we can run. And so there's sort of this naturalness to the movement, but then also a simplicity about it, right? We can love other activities and other sports, but a lot of times those require a significantly bigger equipment investment or, you know, the, the logistics of it. You know, if you love basketball, you know, you can just go and you can just like go to a local um, park and you can shoot around a little bit and, and kind of casually hang out with your friends. But you need to join a league that has games at certain times and there needs to be a referee and teams and uniforms and, and sort of all of these things that make it a little bit more complicated to just go and do what you love and what you enjoy. Same thing with, you know, cycling, for example. We need to have the equipment. We need to have the, the stuff. We need to have places to go to do these things. Running, almost anyone can just walk out their front door and just use what they have at their disposal. We can also get into... So it's very accessible. Yeah, it, it's accessible in a way that some other activities aren't. You know, maybe you love canoeing or kayaking. That means you have to go to a place where yeah, yeah, you can yeah. do those things. And that's not necessarily easy for people to do on a daily basis. When we are running, there's also this ability to reach what we often will call that sort of runner's high. Or just that steady state you get in the zone it's just one foot after another. You don't have to think about it. When you're doing other activities, playing team sports, even as much as we enjoy those things, we can't just zone out while we're in the middle of a hockey game. Instead, when we're running, we can just kind of fall into the pattern of it. We can plan our day. We can solve our problems. We can make next month's content calendar for our business. There's so many things that we can do as we're running, thinking through issues and problems that once we get back from that morning run, now we, we feel refreshed, we feel ready to start the day, we know exactly what we have to do next. It's painful though, running. Like personally, I have a um, love-hate <laughs> relationship with running. Um, on the one side, I literally have major anxiety before every single run, thinking, you know, the the part X of my brain is thinking about like every excuse why I shouldn't be running today. Maybe I didn't sleep enough. Maybe I didn't eat well. Maybe there's always an excuse. I need to rest today because I ran a couple days ago. There's always an excuse why not to run. Um, on the other side, one of my goals in life is to run for as long as I can. So I want to be like an 85 year old and running. Um, so, you know, I'm living between that all the time and, People that, because I do run consistently, and besides I'm on day 12 or 13 now without running, which I told you about and I'm not proud about, and I will we'll return next <laughs> week, listeners to running. Um, but it's, you know, it's, um, it's something that I do consistently. So because I do it consistently, the people in my life around me assume that it's an easy thing for me and I enjoy, I enjoy it. And it's, a, oh, I have a run today. It's so lovely to go and run a few miles out in the sun. Um, but it's nothing like that. So is it some sort maybe of a, a, a positive addiction to that runner's high? Um, is runner's high a, a real thing or is it just something that uh, we kind of make up in our brain? Like is there a, you know, is there a, 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 a something that changes in our body chemically when we finish a run that actually does produce this positive feeling inside of us? Yeah, but the thing is it can be hard to achieve that. And I love that point that you bring up around, you know, some of the sort of anxiety or stress or excuses that we start to get into when it comes to running. And what we see so often with people who see running almost as a punishment sometimes, their brain is giving them a lot of no signals when they think about running. Chances are they're pushing themselves too hard when they run. They're trying to run at a pace at a distance that is painful. It doesn't need to be that way. If instead we really settle into this 80-20 rule of running, which is where we spend most of our time running at an easy or a conversational pace, and then spend only 20% of our time doing those harder, more intense workouts. So you're saying the 80-20 doesn't apply for a specific run? You mean in terms of... Overall. So if you run 10 times this month, 
eight of them should be easy and conversational and pretty fun. Yeah, or we can think about it in terms of the actual mileage. So if we run 100 miles this month, then 80 of those miles would be easy conversational pace. Hmm. So when we talk about this easy running, part of what's happening is not only are we developing those aerobic systems that ultimately make us a better, stronger runner, but we are also now able to tap in to that enjoyment of running that a lot of people are missing out on. When people run and they come to me for coaching and they tell me that they run, but almost begrudgingly, they, they hate running, they find it so difficult, so challenging, they wanna get better at it, but they really struggle with actually liking it as they're going through the motions. Often what's happening is they're just going out there too fast. So because they're pushing themselves as hard as they can through every single workout, the brain is perceiving that as a negative thing. And so then when the next time rolls around to do that, our brain has become hardwired to want to avoid things that hurt us, right? You know, th and this starts with very, very basic human nature where you touch a hot stove, you pull your hand away, and then next time you see the hot stove, you, you know, your brain is, don't go near it. When we apply that to things like exercise, when people are trying to push themselves way beyond their, their current fitness level, trying to do things beyond their capacity, they're getting these negative feedback loops from the brain, which make them find it very difficult to get out the door and go for that run. But if instead we can slow it down, settle into that easy pace running, and just focus on enjoying the process of training, we can then start to get those positive brain chemicals from running and really start to fall in love with it, which increases our ability to be consistent, not get as many injuries, and run into our 70s, 80s, 90s, and beyond. Do you get any um, pre-run anxieties then nowadays? You know, I would only say that maybe before like a, a long run, if, if I don't maybe feel as prepared as I should be, but on a morning like this where I'm going to go out and, and do today, I did a little over four miles. Not at all. Not at all. Can't okay. wait to get out the door. So that is a beautiful place to be. It um, is. I guess it's a it's it's just a bit counterintuitive maybe for people to maybe enjoy a workout. You know, we're so conditioned to like being tough and trying to exert every ounce of energy. No um, pain, no gain. Yeah, no pain, no gain. Yeah. Like, you know, I was in a... Um, totally. Last week I went to uh, two studio uh, workouts. One was a yoga workout and one was like a 45-minute fitness type, you know, uh, plyometrics and push-ups and weights and all these different things nonstop. Yep. It's very fun. Uh, it seems like people are addicted to it. The classes are always fully booked. Um, but it's so difficult. Um, and, you know, it's it's almost like it seems to me very difficult to keep it at a consistent um, level of, you know, showing up however many times you want to show up every week until you're 85 because there's a lot of, you know, you're, you're give by pushing yourself like that. In by the way, it's also in a hot room, so you're sweating like you know, like crazy. Um, but being in that situation, it's like I, I definitely I can't see myself doing that until I'm 85, because I don't think my shoulders will withstand it, my knees, everything. But running at a maybe at a a pace that I enjoy, let's put it that way, um, I can see myself doing for a very, very, very long time, both psychologically, mentally, um, and also physically, absolutely. Um, but I also have realized that I struggle with slowing down. So that's, that's what I'm at this stage now that I'm trying to figure out with myself, because every book that I read about running, like personal experiences from professional runners, ultra marathoners, all these different Ironman, all these different things, everyone, there seems like to be a consensus, um, even on the professional level, that what you just said is that all of them had to learn to run slower in order to progress and perform better for the long run, in the long run. So I try to implement it, but then I go on my run and I'm telling myself that it's going to be an easier, maybe slower run, which I can enjoy and maybe plan my month and, uh, you know, think about life, maybe meditate. But as, as I get warm, as I'm, I'm like, you know, sinking into this run, I find it very difficult to restrain myself. It's like I need, because I'm out, because I actually pushed myself and left the door, it's like I need to 
you know, past a certain threshold of pain, a certain threshold of stress, a certain uh, threshold of sweat. Why? Yes. Well, there's this huge ego part that goes along with it, right? It's always ego. It's always ego and competition. And even if the only competition is ourselves, what a lot of, um, you know, people who have been runners for a long time have noticed, you know, people who are maybe now professional coaches and, and stuff like that who have personally been running for 20 plus years, you know, they, they report that when they were young, there was no technology. So when they were running as young athletes, you just went out for an easy run, right? Your coach told you to run at an easy pace and you just did it. Now, with all the technology we have, Strava, our watches, all this constant monitoring of things like pace, people really need to get comfortable with slowing down, not only for their own sake, but also of, in terms of what that looks like to the outer world. And when we get too caught up in some of those numbers, you know, and, and there's this competitiveness to it of always wanting to perform better, get faster, like do all of this stuff. And it's very counterintuitive, as you mentioned, with running, where we truly need to slow down in order to ultimately speed up. And this happened for me when uh, I look at kind of my first half marathon experience, the years that followed were a lot of frustration because I was so focused on this pace that I had previously run my first half marathon, did a lot of running at goal marathon pace. Don't do that. But I did. And then when I tried to recreate that in my next couple of training cycles, I wasn't getting faster. And I was so frustrated and I couldn't figure out what the problem was, why I wasn't doing better, why I was slowing down at my races versus getting faster. You know, I was, I was trying to do the same things I did the first time and it just wasn't working. It wasn't until I checked my ego and I slowed down and polarized my training, right? Really applied this 80-20 rule to my own training that then the next half marathon I did, I took a full 10 minutes off my PR. So wh- who put that in front of you, that the 80-20 rule? Who told you to uh, check your ego? Well, no one, no, no one particular person. I, I didn't have a coach at the time. And so there wasn't someone who was looking at my dad and saying, you know, Steph, you need to run slower. Um, but that was around the time that I started getting very interested in running from a professional lens. So prior to that, I had been working as a personal trainer, really just teaching strength training, working with clients on, you know, gym workouts and, and building strength and fitness like that. But my evolution as a professional was that I I started to get really interested in specifically strength training for runners. So I was just in sort of my baby era of being a runner myself, but I we always get really excited if I had a client who was a runner and I had all sort of these bits of knowledge that I had picked up along the way that I could share about strength training specifically for runners and the value of it and the muscles and the mechanisms and the things that were working. And so as part of my continuing education, I started doing more and more courses on running. And that's when I really started to learn about not only strength training and its role in running performance, but also some of the specific training strategies that we can use to ultimately impact and improve a runner's performance. And it was amazing applying those to myself in that training cycle Um, I also did a lot of running without a a properly paced GPS watch. So I wasn't really tuned into my pace on those easy runs, which helped a lot. Then that's when I really saw like my own performance improve by a significant degree. And is that something that um, like, do do you, do you also understand the science behind that, behind running slowly to improve? Yeah. Yeah. Because it's all, again, it is very counterintuitive. So I think hearing the science will um, help me, but also other people understand. <laughs> Absolutely. There's a number of specific adaptations that take place in our bodies when we run slow. And what this is called is our aerobic base. So if you ever hear the term building your aerobic base or building aerobic fitness, this is exactly what we're talking about. It's that slow, easy running, that slow, easy training. So the first thing that happens, we can think about our body's aerobic base like an engine. And so when we are building aerobic fitness using these strategies, we're basically helping our body build a bigger engine. Then when we need to maximize the power output from that engine, we have a bigger base of fitness that that is built on. 
if we spend too much training time doing the speed work, we don't have the foundation of aerobic fitness that we can pull out on race day to really succeed. Because the reality is that even a 5K race is still going to be aerobic. And a marathon distance is absolutely aerobic. Even the fastest marathoners in the world are doing that run, that entire race, 95% of that race is going to be aerobic for them. So even elite athletes at those distances aren't tapping into the anaerobic system when they're performing at those events. The other thing that happens is we get more mitochondria within our muscle cells. So when we're doing that slow, easy running, our body is adapting to that workout by actually putting more powerhouses within our cells allowing us to generate more energy when we need it. Within our muscle cells, we also see a better ability to use fat as a fuel source. So we talk, you know, a lot in, in the nutrition space about getting fat adapted or keto adapted and how, you know, talking about potential benefits of that to help with endurance running. Yep. But in actuality, it's the training that helps us use fat as fuel better. So putting the time into easy running means that when you get into a race something like a half marathon, marathon, ultra marathon, where you're going to be using a combination of fat and carbohydrates for fuel, you're going to have more carbohydrates available to you at the end of that race, because you are able to use more of your body's fat stores to fuel more of those miles. So all of these specific adaptations that are happening within our body are a huge reason why building our aerobic base is so beneficial. And we see it help with running performance across all race distances. What we also see though, is a reduced risk of injury just because of the reduced impact forces of slower, easier running, right? The faster we run, the harder we're hitting the ground, the more recovery time we need in between those workouts. But we can dramatically increase our mileage and get all these physiological benefits of easy running just because we're not putting as much strain on our bodies to do it. Mm. So by unlocking our ability to tolerate more time on our feet, to do more running volume. Now, of course, we're going to get better results from our training because we're able to tolerate those higher mileage weeks. Yeah. I I told you I ran um, half marathon distance a couple of times. And in both times, like towards the end, I was getting pretty fatigued. And But I noticed that when I slowed down my pace my hip flexors and my calves started cramping. So I had to maintain that faster pace. Is that something that you've come across or that makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, you know, a big reason here is that you're just not used to it. Haven't spent any time running easy. And so, of course, it's going to feel weird because there is a difference in terms of our, our running mechanics and our gait between slower running and faster running. So when we look visually at what happens between slow running and faster running, there are some things that are going to occur stride length increases, the angle of our leg making contact with the ground, all of these things are going to change. And if you've trained your movement pattern in a very specific way, it's hard to change that, especially in a race scenario where adrenaline is pumping, your muscles and, and everything are already fatigued. Yeah. To start changing things at that point isn't going to go so well. But if we have built up our capacity, built up that time running slow in advance, then we have a little bit more wiggle room with different paces and, and different things that we can do in a race situation. What is your, where does maybe um, running at different speeds? Um, I'm trying to like, um, in, you know, within the same run, should you be playing around with speeds or should you be holding it consistent? That's where that 20% comes in. Mm. So the 80-20 rule, we talk a lot about the 80. Um, I feel like running coaches are always... Oh, the, the 20 sounds like um, I'm already getting anxiety just thinking about that 20%. <laughs> the 20% is that little bit of speed work. Now, depending on a runner's goal, the race distance they're pre preparing for, their experience, all that stuff, that 20% can look very different for different people. But that might include things like interval training where we're going to do a workout where we're going to run a little bit faster for a couple minutes or, or maybe a mile at a time. And then we're going to back off, walk, light jog in between, do it again. Maybe we're going to do that, you know, two or three times if we're doing longer intervals, maybe 10 times for short things like two minute intervals. But of course, it can look really different depending on what your specific running goal is and, and what you're working towards. And then we have something called a progression run, 
A progression run is where we just gradually build speed little by little over the course of that run. So we're finishing the run a little bit faster than where we started. Or we have something like a tempo run where that's going to be a shorter distance. We're going to just run a little bit faster than our easy pace for, you know, maybe just a couple of miles. So when we sprinkle in that speed work, that 20%, that can look really different for different people. And a lot of runners who are used to running easy or they're used to running at a certain pace, they can feel a little bit of stress or anxiety about the speed work and how hard it's going to be in it and what they're going to have to do. But just like with easy running, we never want to put a runner in a situation where they're trying to train beyond their current fitness capacity, right? That no pain, no gain mentality around fitness is completely wrong. We have to train for the level that we're at right now, not the level that we want to be at. We are not going to get anywhere with our fitness. We're not going to get anywhere with our performance by training 10 steps ahead of where we need to be right now. Instead, our speed work should be for the level that we're at. It should be challenging, but it should be doable. If you're getting to the end of a speed workout and you feel like you can't take another step or it hurts, you know, and, and I mean hurts in the sense of like joint pain or you feel like you, you pulled something or you're just so exhausted that you're just so grateful that it's over with, it's probably a little bit too hard for you. Dizziness. Yes. <laughs> Throwing up. None of that. No one should ever be throwing up during or after a workout. If that is happening to you, that workout was too hard, or you did something wrong with your nutrition, that'll, that also could be part of it. But you should finish even a speed workout, feeling like if you had to do another one or two repetitions, you could. Maybe you don't want to, but you could. That's, that's a good place to be. That, that's about the intensity and, and the level that we want to strive for, even with our speed work. And this should ensure like more consistent training. This should ensure that someone can do this for longer without being burnt out, right? Well, and I think it really does because not only does this lead to more enjoyment of the workouts and this feeling of empowerment that we can go, you know, yeah, I can do that. I mean, nothing is worse for our ego. Nothing is more crushing than not being able to finish a workout and feeling like trash about it, you know, about ourselves, about our fitness, about our worth as a human, Instead, if we can use exercise as a way to help people build confidence in themselves, to empower themselves, to look at what they can do, not what they can't do, it's amazing how much we build in terms of internal motivation. People can't wait to get to their next workout because they want to see what's next. They want to challenge themselves a little bit more. And it's such a beautiful thing that organically happens, even in individuals who will tell you at the outset that they hate running or they hate exercise, they don't like any of it. If we if we are a little bit gentle in our approach and we start slow and, and really build from the place that they're at, next thing you know, they're the ones asking for more. And it's beautiful when that happens. So the uneducated, um, I would say, maybe not the uneducated like myself, but um, the ones maybe who haven't implemented this counterintuitive um, theory or this counterintuitive science um, what other mistakes are, or so for these people running too too fast, I would say, because everyone, you know, for even beginner runners, um, they would say, but I only run 10 minutes and I'm already running so slow. So I, even those people are probably running too fast. Yeah, probably. We might need to incorporate walk breaks mm. into it to, to keep our heart rate low enough that we're still in that easy zone. Yeah. And like, and would, is jogging sufficient? Yeah. And, you know, when we look at the difference between what would count as a jog and what would count as a run, that's a little bit of gray area, yeah. right? There's slow running by definition, which means that we don't have what we call an airborne phase. And so that means that your one foot is hitting the ground, making that contact with the ground before you've picked up your other foot to enter the swing phase. With faster running, you have an airborne phase where both feet are going to be off the ground at the same time. But there isn't a hard and fast rule about what we would count as jogging versus running. But if we kind of want to think about our speeds as being maybe gears on a car, right? We have maybe one through five. We want to spend most of our time in, in sort of gear one, gear two, and then use that 20% to kind of develop our speed in gears four and five. 
Yeah. Um, and you said it can be looked at the 80 20 in terms of mileage, not necessarily in terms of workout. So if every workout is an 80 20, is that a good way to implement it? So if 80% of my run that day, I'm running in that enjoyable pace, and then the last 20% is when I um, move to gear four, five, six. I would split it up. Mm. I would split it up. And the reason this is important is because you want to make sure that you're having that recovery time in between those harder workouts. So not only do we want to spend less time in those harder pace zones, we also need that downtime to allow our body to adapt. Because the reality is, and this is something that a lot of, um, you know, our, our average day-to-day -day runners don't know, is that fitness is not built during the workout. It's built in between. Also counterintuitive to our uneducated brains. Yes. So again, when we think about it as this like no pain, no gain, we have to work as hard as we can every single workout to build fitness. No. In fact, we want to work smarter, not harder when it comes to our fitness. Because if we are encountering a certain amount of muscle damage when we exercise, which is normal and expected, we get this muscle damage. We then need to give our bodies time to heal, to recover, and to adapt. And if we never do that, we're sort of just trying to do more muscle damage on top of more muscle damage on top of more muscle damage, which then builds into this cumulative fatigue that becomes burnout or our overuse injuries. So by setting up our plan overall to have that rest and recovery time built in, having rest days, having time in between our hardest workouts, you know, separating those by a few days, it's amazing what we can accomplish and we actually don't have to just work harder or run more miles. Is there a minimum number of times per week, though, to keep that balance of continuous progression that someone needs to run? It depends on your goals and depends on where you're starting from. If you're a brand new runner, running three days a week is great. But there may reach a point where you've built as much fitness as you can doing maybe two easy runs and one faster run per week. Rather than continuing to add mileage to those three runs, it would be better for you from a fitness perspective to add in more frequency to your training. So to add in a fourth day of running, building up that mileage over the course of four days versus three is a great way to progress. If you're someone who previously has been running five or six days a week, then cutting it down to three will maintain your fitness to a degree, but you're not going to continue to build fitness when you drop down your volume. So there's no kind of perfect magic number for any of that stuff really just depends on the runner, their experience, maybe what kinds of cross training or other activities they're doing. And these are all things that are so important to consider when we're talking about a personalized training program. Yeah, but I'm asking that because, um, you know, a lot of like a lot of people who want to do yoga, they want to do a fitness class, they want to do spinning and they want to run. Um, so if someone's running once a week or twice a week, um, will they all, always stay stagnant even if they're consistent with that once or twice a week runs, or do they need to reach that threshold of at least three times a week to really allow for that development? Well, it depends on the running goals. You know, if you have someone... But, but, but if the goal, sorry to... Um, but yeah. if the goal is like slow progression, just to progress in running, whatever the goals are, but to not stay stagnant and to keep improving it month by month by month, that's what I'm trying to uh, figure out because and I'm asking it from a selfish, from a selfish perspective mm -hmm. because I don't think I'm alone here is... I don't want to only run. I want yeah. to mix in everything. So there's not enough days in the week for everything. This is where the concept of periodization of training comes into play. To allow yourself different seasons where you're focusing more on different activities so that in the long run, you're building a more well-rounded fitness program and you become a more well-rounded athlete. So what that means is that rather than trying to do all the things all the time with our training and, and doing, you know, double workout days and, and one day of this and one day of that. And, you know, it feels a little bit chaotic and unorganized when we look at it that way. Instead, we might say, okay, I'm going to sign up for this 10K race. So for the three months leading up to my 10K race, I'm going to do more running. Still going to maybe include my yoga one day or two days a week. I'm going to do more days of running. I'm not going to do my cycling, or maybe I'll do cycling less often, one day a week, for example, do my strength training, you know, kind of kind of build that all in. But my focus for the next three months is going to be my running. 
then after that, I'm going to take a little bit of an off season from running and I'm going to drop down the number of days that I'm running per week, not to zero, but just drop it down by a little bit. And I'm going to increase my focus on other things. And then maybe in six months or in nine months, I think I might sign up for another race and I'm going to spend my time getting ready for that. And so these blocks of time that we break our training into this periodization of our training is exactly how we accomplish what you're looking for. Building fitness in different areas, building fitness in different aspects of our lives that allow us to, you know, zoom out at the end of a year or two years. We've built up tremendous fitness. We've built up lots of skill in all these different things, but without it being kind of too many cooks in the kitchen all at one time. Yeah, and you said, but sometimes there needs to be like an, an extra cook or two in the, kitchen, in the kitchen because you kind of mentioned that, for example, to be a healthy injury-free runner, you need to do some strength training as well. So yes. is that also a common mistake that maybe new runners or maybe not even just generally runners make? Yes, runners as a whole, I think we can be very general about this, but I think we can be pretty accurate with it. Do not spend enough time strength training. <laughs> And there's a few reasons for it. You know, I mean, first, it's just a lack of knowledge. You know, we talked about the beauty of running and the simplicity and the naturalness of running and, and just how it's so easy to throw on your shoes and head out the door. And it's so great for mental health and all of that stuff. Strength training is different. And strength training requires more knowledge, more intention, choosing the right exercises, the right number of sets and, and reps and and all of that stuff. And it can start to feel very confusing and when we don't feel confident about doing something we don't know if we're doing it right we don't want to hurt ourselves we don't know if it's working we tend to just forget about it but there is a tremendous improvement in running performance as well as injury risk that we see with strength training so it is something that all runners should have as a core part of their running program a lot of runners would benefit tremendously from dropping even day of running you know if they're running five or six days a week dropping a day of running in favor of adding in a strength training session or an extra strength training session. Specifically on strength training, uh, something I implemented about a year and a half ago is specifically spending time every week, whether it's once a week or twice a week, but doing strength training, A, for my hip flexors, um, but B, and more importantly for me, is my tibialis anterior um, cause I always used to get shin splints and then I saw a YouTube video or something on how you can actually hopefully solve shin splints just by strengthening that area around your shins. And ever since I've been consistent with that, again, knock on wood, <laughs> um, really zero shin splints. Uh, and I always run on concrete and I, you know, I am, I'm always expecting it to happen every, every run, but it just doesn't. Um, so anyone out there who's uh, facing shin splints, uh, try them out. Uh, try any exercises to strengthen the area around the shins. Um, I'm assuming you face a lot of people that have shin splints and shin splints is a horrible, horrible thing. Um, what do you recommend when it comes to shin splints? Yeah, well, it's actually really interesting. That That is an injury in particular that it's not really clear how or why shin splints happen. You know, some of the other injuries that we see with running, there's a very distinct pathway of like, okay, this is the problem. This is where we're feeling the pain. Okay. You know, if we're talking plantar fasciitis, for example, or, or, you know, Achilles tendonitis or something like that. But with shin splints, it's not one specific thing, but a number of factors that can all sort of play a role yeah, in the development. One day it can hurt, three days it won't hurt. And then for a week it will hurt. Yeah. Unpredictable. Absolutely. But strengthening, you know, all of our body's muscles really helps to reduce the impact forces that we're getting through the bones when we run, when we hit the ground. When we hit the ground each time we're, we're taking a step when we're running, there's vibrations that are traveling up through the bones in our body. Muscles help to absorb some of that impact and prevent these excess vibrations from traveling through the bones. And so not only are the muscles helping to absorb some of that and, and, you know, keep our bones away from these excess vibrations, but they're also holding our bones in place a little bit more securely so that then we're not getting too much movement through the bones, which then can lead to a lot of issues. So when it comes to something like shin splints, you know, we certainly want to look at running form and, and running mechanics. We want to look at footwear. 
one of the things that I'll often ask clients about when they sort of present with this issue is how old are those running shoes that you've been wearing? Because mm -hmm. some people have been kicking around in the same pair since 2017. We want to look at, you know, are your running shoes maybe just worn out and, and inappropriate? Do we need to upgrade those? Running surfaces, of course, maybe something to consider. And then, you know, strengthening exercises, especially for those muscles in the shin. What are some other mis common mistakes that you see um, runners make that really you know, um, just hurts their performance or hurts their, their consistency or enjoyment of the act of running? The biggest, most common one would be entering into running, not only because we want to be a good runner, um, but also because we want to lose weight. And there's a lot of runners who have been told time and time again, and this is, this is not the fault of the runner, it's just the culture and the environment that we live in, that the fast track to weight loss is just simply eating less and moving more. And this eat less, move more mindset is so detrimental to a lot of runners who are trying to do these tremendous volumes of exercise while stick to extremely low calorie diets. Definitely increases our risk of injuries, definitely impairs performance, and really leaves you feeling drained and like all of these workouts suck. But when we're well fueled, when we're well hydrated, when we're taking care of our bodies in that way, getting the nutrients and the energy that we need to perform well, it's amazing how good we can feel during our workouts. And then we're able to actually perform better and get better quality training sessions in, which ultimately is what leads us to getting better results. So the most common thing that I see people doing here is really getting into that what we call low energy availability because they think that what they just need to really do is, is buckle down, eat less and move more, and they're going to reach all their goals. And, and the wheels really fall off the wagon. They don't understand what's happening. They're working so hard but getting nowhere. And trying to change our relationship with food in that respect can be really difficult because it's about as coward or intuitive as everything else we've discussed today. It's one of those things that doesn't make sense when you first talk about it. But, you know, maybe you actually need to eat a little bit more to see the results and the changes in your body that you want to see. It sounds absolutely absurd but it is completely 100 percent valid so we just follow our instinct our ego which is a lot of the times just uh wrong yeah and, and i mean a lot of this is also influenced by you know diet culture as, as we often will call it and the fact that many many of the popular diets that we've gone through over the years um have not been built for runners and so if we are looking at someone who is very sedentary and does eat more calories than they need to, then yeah, a little bit of exercise, a little bit of movement, and, and maybe being mindful of portion sizes might be a great strategy. But runners are a very unique bunch because we're burning a lot of calories with all of these volumes of training we're doing. And if we're doing that in a low fuel state, if we're doing that in a, in a space where we don't have enough energy to be supporting our training, we start to see a lot of physiological compromises that need to be made. We start seeing symptoms of low energy availability like hormone issues, gut issues, sleep issues, brain, memory fog, concentration issues. And for some runners, this can also really trigger excess cravings. And I can't tell you how many runners come to me and their, their biggest concern is they need to just figure out a way to cut the sugar cravings. They need to figure out a way to stop overeating in the evenings. And what they expect is that I'm going to tell them that they just need more willpower. You know, you just need to follow this, this low carb or low calorie healthy eating plan and stick to it. And, and that's the magic solution. But when they find out the real solution to their problem is that they need to eat more, fuel their bodies with more energy, get in more carbs throughout the day. It sounds crazy, but it works. And it's so wonderful to see how well it works to get those messages from clients, even just a few weeks into working with me, it's like, oh, wow, you know, I, I can't believe that, you know, I ate so many more carbs during the day. And then I got to the evening time and I didn't snack at all in front of the TV, TV before bed. I felt satisfied. I felt good. And my run was awesome. You know, I had these great quality workout sessions and then I'm not feeling completely out of control around food later in the day. So it's one of those many things that sounds crazy. But when we put it into practice, when we trust the process, it's incredible what we can do. I also read a lot about running and aerobic fitness, how it's being, you know, it's how it's so crucial for longevity. 
um, and for really, you know, maintaining health for as long as possible and then living for longer. Um, and I'm, um, I think that a lot of people are also interested in running for that reason and why people are interested in improving their aerobic fitness. Um, but I always hear about VO2 max as well as a, as a measurement, as a certain threshold that you have to, uh, have to cross. And as a former athlete, um, we were always, always focusing on that VO2 max, um, which would indicate whether you're fit enough to play or not. Um, so is that something that people should be paying attention to? Should they be measuring it? How can they measure on their VO2 max? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, you know, what's interesting about VO2 max is that we do know that people who have a higher VO2 max are at a reduced risk for heart disease. So there, there is some sort of, you know, chronic disease sort of longevity benefit to having, you know, better cardiovascular fitness. But the way that we get to that better VO2 max, you know, the way that we improve our fitness is still with those foundations of building that aerobic capacity. So it's not that these two ideas need to be in opposition to each other. It's not mm. that these two things need to be sort of a one or the other thing. But if we apply these basic principles of fitness and, and apply these sort of basic strategies that we've been talking about, we do improve our overall kind of cardiovascular aerobic based fitness but with that extra speed work and, and those workouts that we're going to add in, that's where we can see the improvement in something like our VO2 max. Now, do I think that the average person who's a recreational runner who's maybe doing this specifically for, you know, the love of the sport and the health and, and the longevity of it, do they need to be super tuned into testing their VO2 max and, and kind of looking at it? Absolutely not. You know, we know that doing the healthy things is what makes us a healthy person. It's not really about the numbers. It's not really about the measurements and, and the weight and you know all of that stuff, all the data that we can collect. Mm -hmm. It's about just consistently putting in the work. But a lot of us who are numbers kind of people, we like to have these data points, we like to track things, we like to kind of understand how our body works at this deeper level. It's something that is certainly um, interesting to know, and you certainly can have it measured, have it tested at, at a local facility, but I don't think that it's something that I would uh, recommend or, or kind of encourage people to keep a close, close eye on if ultimately their goal is just to be a, a really healthy old person one day. It's it's always a, uh, I'm kind of happy you said that because testing your VO2 max is painful. It's not easy. It's not, not easy. And, and it's not something that you can just like easily do at home. Yeah. So you do have to have access to facilities where you can and can get this done. And so when it starts to become questions of, of time and money and logistics of some of this stuff, there needs to be a good reason for doing these tests. I wouldn't put it super high on my list for most people. Makes sense. Running mechanics, you know, also on my runs, I, again, not claiming to be a, uh, you know, a genius when it comes to running mechanics, but you see some people where you're like, oh my God, that person, someone needs to adjust everything in their body to make sure that they can, you know, not break in a few minutes um so it, it seems painful sometimes so it seems to me like a mistake that many runners make is uh, maybe not knowing exactly how to run and or maybe they just don't have an objective view of what they look like and you know how they're actually running um so is that something that you really focus on with your clients is the mechanics is my first part of the question and my second part Correct mechanics. You know, there's always that question on the heel strike that I always uh, see thrown up in the air. Should there be a heel strike? Should you put an emphasis on your heel or should it be a more of a, a midfoot or, you know, um, um, what's the area like just before the toes? Forefoot. The, fo the forefoot area. Yeah. Um, so what should it look like and what should we be emphasizing or what we should be striving for? Yeah, that's a really good question. So when we're talking about running form and, and mechanics and kind of how I use it in my day to day, Something that I really only zero in on or hone in on if there's a problem. So if a client is um, questioning, you know, they have a history of injuries, they're questioning their running form and stuff like that, a gait analysis is a great tool that we can use to look at some of these things. But for a lot of runners who don't have any specific concerns or injuries or issues like that, a gait analysis can certainly be interesting. 
But what we have to understand is that there is no single perfect running form, this mm. box that everyone needs to fit into. And so we want to be careful to not pathologize something that isn't a problem if it isn't a problem for that individual. Now, there are a few things that you see that can be very prominent in some individuals that, that do need correction because down the road with higher volumes of training, it can lead to inju injury. Um, but we don't want to, just because we have the tools and technology to, to zero in and, and screenshot and freeze frame and measure every little thing, doesn't mean that we need to do that. It's just one of the many tools that we have at our disposal, and it can be really insightful for some individuals. Um, when we're looking at kind of specifics of some of the things that we can very easily visually see that can be an issue, you know, a lot of it has to do with the strength of our hips, the angle of our hips, and the angle of our tibia and our feet. This can lead to, for some people, this excessive pronation or rolling in of the foot, which we know is something that we do want to avoid. A little bit of pronation isn't a problem. It's when it starts to become excessive. Now, some people have these differences in, in just the way their body frame is, just the way that, that they're built, where they have hips that are a little bit more turned in. They might have um, feet that point a little bit more out. And these are things that we just sort of need to train around and, and just sort of be mindful of. They're not necessarily issues that we can correct because someone's bone structure is, is not something that we can strength train out of them. And this is where, you know, exercises to, to strengthen some of the other impacted areas, proper footwear, and, and just educating that runner on what their gait looks like and, and sort of where things might pop up. And, and of course, taking into consideration good recovery all becomes an important part of that puzzle. But there's a wide variation of running mechanics that can be healthy for lots of different runners. If we have good quality coordination of our muscles, so neuromuscular coordination, then even people who do some what we might call funny things when they run, some, some small kind of um, differences in their gait. We were speaking about uh, friends references. Um, there's the Phoebe, the Phoebe yes. episode where she runs. Yes. Yeah. Now, Phoebe is expending a lot of energy when she runs. Phoebe is not an efficient runner. So Phoebe might struggle with longer distances because she's burning calories all over the place with all the arm movements. So we do want our running stride to be efficient when it can be. But what's interesting, and, and I love that you mentioned that specifically, is that each runner is going to naturally fall into their most efficient stride. So sometimes overthinking things can actually lead to more problems. We want to keep as much of that runner's form natural as we can. We want to keep people moving through their natural movement patterns as much as we can and just fix what absolutely needs to be fixed or tweaked. We don't want to start kind of looking for problems and, and making changes, making movements, if that's not necessarily an issue for them. Yeah, um, and that leads me to something I can't help but bringing it up, footwear, and you mentioned footwear a couple of times, and we've also spoken about on this podcast a couple of times with, uh, with guests about footwear, about the barefoot movement and all those things. Um, so there is an argument out there that the only reason we heel strike is because we put comfy cushions under our heel. And if we didn't put comfy cushions under our heel, we wouldn't foot strike. And um, the one of the arguments that people throw around for that is that if you, if you are at home barefoot and your baby screams in the other room and you sprint to the other room, you won't heel strike you'll kind of run on your four, was it the forefoot? Your midfoot, yeah. A midfoot, forefoot, yeah. Um, so yeah, what, 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 do you, what do you think about that? Okay, so multi-part answer. And I, again, <laughs> super good question, multi-part answer. So the first thing is that- It's a hot topic nowadays in the community, right? In the community of runners, of yes. uh, people that have an interest in this. Yes, exactly. And, and you know, what I'll say about that is the, the, the beautiful thing about the world that we live in in this day and age is that we have options. Right. So we don't all have to go out and buy the one pair of running shoes on the market because there isn't just one pair of running shoes on the market. Right. So we don't have to all follow the exact same things and do the exact same things and run the same way and eat the same foods and, and all of that stuff. We have so many choices, so many options. Right. We can buy running shoes 
from any brand out of any country in the entire world, and they'll be shipped right to our door. And so, you know, what I, what my preference with a lot of this stuff is to really remove myself from any of the shoulds or, or sort of the drama around these conversations, because it always comes down to what's best for that person as an individual. So specifically to your question about, you know, the midfoot strike versus the heel strike. When we're talking about running efficiency, there is a small benefit in terms of efficiency and impact to a heel strike pattern when we're running slightly more slowly. And I don't mean slow, slow running, like, you know, sort of jogging we talked about there, mm -hmm. but we're running a little bit slower. Now, if we are running faster than a six minute mile, there's a difference in terms of efficiency when we switch to more of a midfoot strike pattern. So if you're running at top speed as fast as you possibly can to get from point A to point B because there's an emergency, a screen baby or whatever it might be. I don't know what every individual person's top speed is, but when you start going as fast as you possibly can, there is more efficiency with a midfoot strike. But so, so if we look at Olympians who sprint um, or even like Olympians who are long distance runners because they run faster than six minute miles, right? Um, way faster than that, which is crazy. Um, do, so do they focus less on the heel strike and more on the midfoot strike? Yeah, and, and when you look at elite runners, you know, when you look at footage of elite runners, they all look different when they run. Mm. And, and that's a great indication that there is no one size fits all to running form and running mechanics, right? Because if you look at the best of the best of the best, they're all still doing slightly different things. Yep. And so um, whatever we have trained, whatever we're comfortable with is going to be the thing that we, we do best. But as I mentioned before too, each individual runner is going to naturally fall into a form that is most efficient for them. And so that again is going to look different for different runners at, at basically every level of sport. Now, of course, they have these elite coaches who are also going to be, you know, tailoring and adapting and, and practicing things with them for, for all of us sort of normal people, all of us regular runners out there. Um, you know, a lot of these things are, are things that we have to learn on our own. And so we don't want to get too caught up in, in some of the buzz with different trends and in, in footwear or overthinking things like foot strike pattern and all of that if we don't need to. Another hot topic for you. M male versus female running. The male body is different than the female body. Should females or males, depends which way you look at it, should they be running differently from each other? So not necessarily. Now, there are a few common differences in anatomy that we see from female runners compared to male runners that can change some of the common injuries that, that we get in, in these specific scenarios. Um, female runners, on average, now of course not all the time, but on average have slightly wider hips than men do. And so what that means is that because of these slightly wider hips, we see a little bit more um, of a turning in at the hip, what we call antiverted hips, in women versus men. As well, we can see a little bit more weakness in certain areas, you know, specifically things like core, pelvic floor muscles, in, in particular after someone's had children. So these are things that, you know, as a whole, as a rule, I wouldn't want to say that there are differences in how men and women should train in these specific categories, but more so that we want to look at each runner as an individual and we want to make sure that we're adapting their strength training program, their injury prevention strategies for what's going to make the most sense for them. The author of the book, uh, Born to Run, have you read the book? I haven't read the book. Me neither, but I will. Okay. It's on my list. Um, okay. But I watched a, I listened to a couple of podcasts with, with him as a guest. Um, I saw his one of his TED Talks that he gave. Um, and something that he mentioned there that I find fascinating, and I said it to a few people, and I didn't really get an interesting, an interested reaction. Uh, but hopefully, some people find this interesting here. Um, male versus female. So, at the you know a, a a female versus male. You know, if you take the best, the fastest runner in the world, male versus the fastest runner in the world, female for a hundred meter sprint, the woman has no chance against the the male, the men, the men. If you go to 200 meters, the woman still has no chance. But the longer the distance is, the gap slowly closes. It closes and closes. Yep. And when you get to like ultra marathons mm -hmm. or, you know, 100 miles, 
the, the, there's barely a gap and a woman can definitely beat a man. Um, and his theory behind it is what, or the theory that he subscribes to is that back in the day, thousands and thousands of years ago, uh, hunters and gatherer times, uh, when men had to hunt, the females ran with them and they were together outrunning animals. I find that fascinating. Yeah, and, and I mean, the, the, the fact is we don't really know a lot yeah. of the answers in terms of what our ancestors were up to. Yeah, it's to nice to theorize. It's nice. It, it's a lot of theories, right? I mean, and everything even in terms of, of diet and, and stuff like that, there's a lot of theories. But one of the reasons why, you know, women tend to kind of even the playing field in terms of performance as you get longer and longer in terms of distances one of the reasons, again, you know, theories and, and, you know, a little bit of research emerging, looking at differences physiologically between male and female athletes is that women have a better ability to use fat as a fuel source. Therefore, when we're looking at these longer duration, lower intensity types of, of events, this is where we see women being able to fuel themselves for longer without needing as much carbohydrate for fuel. Now, it's not to say that carbs don't still boost performance. You know, I'm not making a case for any kind of low carb eating. I'm a huge fan of carbs as a fuel source. Um, but when we have that flexibility to draw on our body's fat stores to fuel whatever we're doing, now we see, again, a little bit more of a level playing field. Interestingly, too, if we're talking about things like open water swimming, we also, again, are going to see, um, you know, less difference between male performance and female performance. It's fascinating to me. Um, so definitely need to read that book. I think it's Christopher McDougall is like the, you know, the father of that book. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So look, running is um, it is a love hate relationship in my heart and my brain, um, but definitely leaning towards the love. I remember I ran. Um, for the first time, a 3K race with my brother and my dad when I was very, very young. And I remember in 2006, it was a 2006 World Cup uh, soccer. I'm a soccer fan. So, you know, in, in, a, in soccer, there's um, you get a 15-minute halftime break in the middle. So between games, there was a 15-minute break. I would go for a 15-minute run, come back, continue watching the game. And ever since then, I've been running consistently. Um, it's always, it's not linear. Like now I'm on a 12-day break that or 13-day break that's uh, killing me from within. Um, but I, you know, speaking to you now about this, and I told you like every book I've read always mentions, learn to run slow. Uh, so maybe the, 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 the challenge, the hurdle here is the mental one, not the physical one, because running faster is harder. So you would think that it would get you better results. Uh, but it doesn't. So I will uh, start and run slower and hopefully it helped uh, any runners here, um, any listeners who are runners themselves or listeners who maybe treat runners, have friends who are runners, who work with runners. Um, I think it's, a, it's an important one. And it's a consensus, right, amongst the professionals because another thing um, that I remember listening around this or reading um, around this topic was the, the four-minute mile. Right, it took humanity until what the seventies to break that four-minute mile, um, which people use. And since then, many people, high school kids, can break a four-minute mile now. Um, but it's used as a motivational anecdote, as a psychological anecdote. But in reality, from what I've read, it was just a matter of figuring out how to train properly. It wasn't some psychological barrier. It was a training barrier that we haven't figured out yet. Yeah, and, and we also need to look at how much technology has evolved and, and sort of helped us with some of these feats. So human, um, you know, physiology and, and sort of us as, as um, species haven't changed that much, you know, especially over the last hundred years, since you know, hundred and something years, you know, since running sort of became a sport and, and sort of these recreational running Olympics and all of that mm -hmm. has become a thing. Um, but what's also evolved much faster is running shoe technology, running track technology, things that we use to analyze the data of our training to really hone in on how we can unlock this, this sort of performance potential, right? 
And it's not just not to take away the talent of the athletes. You know, it's not to say that it's all the shoes and the gear and whatever, but it's also being able to dial in to look at heart rate monitoring. It's being able to do things, um, you know, like like some of the teams in Europe right now are doing like la blood lactate um, testing as part of their training protocol to be really dialed in and personalized to where that athlete's lactate threshold is. And, you know, being able to do things like this, unheard of a few decades ago, is allowing us to reach these next levels of performance because we can analyze that data and we can use it to make better, more informed decisions. I had you talking about running for a long time and I told you I can talk about running forever. <laughs> um, you're also a dietitian um, and it's something also we've emphasized on the last couple of days. Um, if, if I haven't mentioned it yet, we filmed a couple courses together um, that'll be online in the next couple of months, which is super exciting about one about injury free running, how to be an efficient runner, how to stay injury free. Um, and the other one is about nutrition, performance nutrition. Um, I just want to, you know, speak about maybe some supplements um, that you recommend in general. I know we, know we spoke about uh, creatine, we spoke about caffeine, I believe. Um, like, what are some things that we should be doing, we should be taking that can really help us, you know, for people who are active and people that are health conscious and you know, again, want to maintain that um, um, that continuous progression in health and fitness in life. The first thing we have to do is we have to be eating enough to fuel our training. Before we can get into any kind of conversation around supplements, we need the foundation of a solid performance nutrition plan. But for the sake of our conversation, let's assume that we're talking about a runner who's getting in enough calories, they're getting in the right macronutrient balance, they're getting in the right meal timing, you know, they're really good about fueling before, during and after their runs, or they're really dialed in and intentional with all of those build up components. Mm -hmm. When we start looking specifically at supplements, you know, there are a few that do have some, some really good research behind them. Now, when we're talking about micronutrients, you know, two of the main ones that people can benefit from just because of a lack of, of uh, dietary sources or, or a lack of consistency with dietary sources with these would be omega-3s and vitamin D. Those are things that, you know, there's not a lot of sources in our, our typical diet and, and people just don't eat those foods often enough to maintain vitamin D levels or, or to get enough omega-3. So those are two of the nutrients that I see myself recommending more often to, to more people. When we, when we talk specifically about the sports supplement side of things, getting away from discussions around nutrients, caffeine is one of the most researched supplements, drugs in the world. So many studies have been done on caffeine because people are interested in it. People like caffeine. And, you know, we have a huge, huge number of people around the world who on a daily basis, caffeine is, is part of their day. Now, what's fascinating is that we can basically split the population down the middle into fast caffeine metabolizers and slow caffeine metabolizers. There's a specific genetic variant that there's about 50% of the population who has the slow metabolizer variant, and there's half the population who has the fast metabolizer variant. This can impact how caffeine impacts performance as well as health. But again, specifically on the performance lens, Individuals who are fast caffeine metabolizers are more likely to see that performance enhancement effect from caffeine use around exercise, particularly endurance exercise. If you're a slow caffeine metabolizer, though, caffeine may not improve your performance. It may actually slow you down. So these are important things to kind of consider that even in the supplement world, you know, one size doesn't fit all. And we do want to make sure that we're as personalized as possible with these types of products that we might be taking because we don't want to take something, use something that ultimately is going to impair our performance when we thought we were going to get an enhancement. Another supplement that is really popular, really well-researched, a um, lot of good science to back it up, would be creatine. Just, sorry. Sorry. Oops. Um, so just to um, stop you a second on the, on the caffeine. So what it, does it, you know, what I feel like caffeine does to me pre-workout um or what i hear from people as well is energy and focus yes so is, is there science behind that or is just that just a psychological side effect no and and so that is a different pathway a different metabolic pathway 
compared to the one that I'm talking about with making you a faster, slow metabolizer. Mm. So there's a difference in how we feel the effects of caffeine that has nothing to do with how quickly it's removed from our bodies. So you can be someone who doesn't feel the effects of caffeine very strongly, but it is in your body for a long period of time and ultimately impairing your performance. So unfortunately, we can't use something like how caffeine makes us feel as an indicator of whether or not it's actually helping us or hindering us. I see. I see. Um, so the other one you just mentioned. Creatine. Creatine. Yes. Also very popular. It's been around for a while. Yes. Um, associated, maybe stereotyped with um, bodybuilders and gyms, the bros. Yes, absolutely. And this is because creatine's uh, sort of action, you know, what it does in our bodies is it's part of those that explosive power. And so being able to generate more force with something like a lift, you know, that's where creatine really plays a role. But what I like about creatine for endurance athletes is that we know that runners don't strength train enough. And so anything that can help us get better results from the strength training that we are doing, if that means that we are going to be able to build more muscle, build more speed, build more power more quickly, that translates into better endurance performance. So it's not that creatine will help us run longer because of the creatine itself. It's sort of this indirect effect that ultimately can help runners get better bang for their buck with the workouts that they're doing in the gym. The negatives. Can we speak about um, alcohol? I want to speak about alcohol and smoking. Yes. So alcohol... And in also maybe, you know, how, how would you would react, you know, a client, they, wanna, they want to get better at running, they want to keep running until they're 85, but they also want to drink, um, have fun with their friends. They also want to smoke because they like the occasional cigarette um, or smoke other things which are legal in Canada, I believe. Um, so yeah, how, so how, how can someone... Um, really, you know, integrate that into their lives and have that balance, if yeah. you will. Yeah. And, and so it all comes down to priorities, you know, and, and the way that I talked about periodization of training, when we are in those race training cycles, we have to focus and prioritize on running. And that may mean having to make some sacrifices with our social life, may mean having to make some sacrifices to, you know, skip going out with our friends to be in bed by a certain time but, so we but, can but get up it, and do our long but run. But is it because people maybe underestimate the negative effects that these things have? Well, I think so, yeah. And it's because it's it's very normal, right? It's very normalized and, and you know, very common um, to consume alcohol and in particular to, to sometimes have more than, than what is considered healthy or even safe in the long run. And depending on, you know, where you live and, and kind of your social circle, there is really this normalcy of drinking significant amounts that if you kind of zoom out a little bit and, and you look at it uh, from a health perspective, from a performance perspective, is far too much. And specifically when we're talking about the impacts of alcohol on performance, it impacts our sleep. It can impact our digestive system, right? We can get more irritation and inflammation in the gut. We can have more GI distress if we've been having alcohol. It impacts our recovery, right? It slows down how our bodies are able to rebuild and repair those damaged tissues. We also are more likely to lose motivation to exercise when we're hungover. And so if you're someone who, you know, likes to go out on a Friday or Saturday night, but you're supposed to get your long run in first thing Saturday or Sunday morning, we really have to look at those habits the night before, not only the eating, the drinking, but also the bedtime habits that are maybe negatively impacting your consistency with running and your ability to perform the full workout. You know, I, I hear from runners, sometimes I encounter this a lot where, you know, oh, I, I had an event that night or I, I was out with friends or whatever, missed my run the next day. And if that's happening a lot, you know, ultimately we're not going to get anywhere with our training because we're just not consistent enough with it. And, you know, it comes down to priorities. When we're in that race training cycle, there may be things in our lives that we have to take a step back from, from a little while to focus on the mileage and the training and all those things we have to put in. But that's why it's also important to give ourselves a little bit of an off season to have some flexibility, be able to have some fun, be able to enjoy our lives and have that quality of life that all of us need. Because if we're so hyper-focused on our training and our volume and we never give ourselves a break, 
that's when we also get burnt out. So it does all come down to a balance. Can food be looked at maybe as a um, implementing the 80-20 rule? Yes, absolutely. In terms of 80% eat in a balanced, healthy, let's say, way and 20% have fun. Yeah, and I think that that's a really good kind of outlook to have because, you know, the runners who are 100 zero where they it's you know so dialed in and and they're so afraid to even like use sports drinks or gels because those have sugar in them and, and they're just so afraid of consuming anything that isn't kind of perfectly within within this healthy diet um you know ideology that they've got those are the runners who definitely are at risk of underfueling um they can have a lot of trouble meeting their energy targets and sometimes there's a lack of sustainability in some of those eating practices what we also see, you know, we, we talked a little bit in the courses that we recorded about eating disorders and disordered eating patterns. And a lot of times when we think about eating disorders, we're thinking specifically about something like anorexia or bulimia. But there's another eating disorder that a lot of people haven't heard of, and it's called orthorexia. What orthorexia is, it's an unhealthy obsession with healthy eating. And so it's it's this preoccupation and, and this fear of eating any foods that, that we sort of deem unhealthier or unclean or, or not okay to the point where it causes us so much stress and anxiety. It's not the food. It's the stress about the food. What's the name of that disease? Orthorexia. 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 Right. Can I uh, self-diagnose and uh, diagnose many people around me? <laughs> well, and, and I think it's probably more common than we realize because this is not, you know, the, the presentation of something like this isn't your typical... You know, when we think of somebody who has anorexia nervosa, right, we, we see that person in our minds, right, that that emaciated, you know, kind yeah. of look. And, you know, we know that that eating disorders do come in all shapes and sizes. You don't have to look like that to have an, an eating disorder. But in our culture today and this, you know, healthy mindset and, and people, you know, wanting to live for longer and, and be their healthiest selves and, you know, that drive that we have, some of these ultimately um, destructive patterns that we see in these individuals are praised by a lot of people. Um, you know, I don't know if, you know, we want to get into names here, but we look at the Gwyneth Paltrow style of eating, right? There are a lot of people who watch and, and, and take in and, and see what she says she does in a day, what she eats in a day, how she kind of operates and how she lives her life and think that that's someone that's worth emulating. But when you are able to zoom out and, and kind of look at that, I mean, that type of mindset and mentality around, you know, the list of, of things that you don't include in your diet ever being so long, that in and of itself can be very problematic. If you have something like orthorexia, you're put in a situation where you don't have control over the food, you don't know how it was cooked, you don't know what's in it, you don't know what's going to be served in an event, that can cause people incredible amounts of stress and anxiety and that's a huge problem if we're looking at flexibility and fun and quality of life running i think you know putting science aside uh, from a personal experience perspective i think running can make people happier um, i think there's um there's definitely things i need to learn about running like like what we were talking about um, and i'll try and implement and i'll try and spread the word as much as I can because I think a lot more people can utilize running and also maybe adapt their running so that they can enjoy it more and be more consistent with it um, so I will but I think it's a fantastic way um, really for mental health physical health feeling strong feeling energized I think it's really crucial and food food is something that we uh, you know everyone everyone in some shape or form is their life is dictated by food because we know we all go grocery shopping, we all have kitchens, um, and we all need to eat at, at least, you know, a couple times a day. And we all do it and we're always all surrounded by food no matter what you do um, and where you are and where you live. And we're also in a, we're lucky in a way to, you know, to be in a, to live in countries and times where, you know, we have an overabundance of food. Um, so we have maybe too many choices and we're surrounded by too many opinions about foods and too many types of foods and too many, um, you know, uh, brainwashed in so many different ways by so many different people. So um, food is, 
is you know i think um king um in our lives um and we need to um live with it uh, we need to find ways to also like you said about running i don't think there's a specific way to eat um i don't think it's the gwyneth paltrow way i don't think it's the my way um but i think everyone needs to explore and at least be aware um so i think what you do is um super important and i think the content you share is fantastic uh, so please steph tell people where they can uh, find you and then we'll um wrap up the show sounds great so yeah so uh as you mentioned at the top of the episode my name is stephanie natchek my company is called stephanie natchek performance nutrition and so I work with clients both one-on-one -on -one and in online programs. So you can work with me no matter where in the world you live or, or where you come from. And I also have my own podcast all about running and nutrition for runners. It's called Fuel Run Recover. And uh, it's really great to be able to talk about this stuff all the time. And, you know, of course, share what I think are really important messages with our running community to really help them feel better so that they can train smarter and, and recover faster and, you know, reconnect with that love of running that, that so many of us want. And this episode is a special one for me because 18 is my number. It's my, uh, you can say lucky number, but my favorite number. Um, so it's a pleasure having you here. Pleasure speaking with you. And I, um, yeah, I'm excited for the relationship that we're building with you. So thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me.